are here this morning and we appreciate your presence, whether in person or online. And we had such a great singing last night. My voice is almost shot, but I only have one day to get it through. So hopefully I'll last. Well, I know I will, but uh, not to lead singing anyway. But anyway, we're going to have Brother Vince Doherty lead us in a song to start us off. And then at the appropriate time, uh, Frederick Heischer will lead us in prayer. He's a 2016 graduate of the Florida School of Preaching, originally from Haiti, I believe, right? And uh, has done work in Cayman Islands and Jamaica. And uh, he has been preaching for the Griffin Road Church of Christ uh, in Bartow, Florida, not too far from here, for about the last three years. But uh, he'll lead the prayer at the appropriate time. But for now, we'll have Vince lead a song, and then I'll introduce uh, this morning's program. And actually, uh, well, yeah, I'll introduce that right here in just a minute. Song number 473, song 473, Oh How I Love Jesus. There is a name I love to see, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest Again, we welcome you to the Florida School of Preaching 46th Annual. Signed up for today, and it's going to start out with Brother Neil Pollard speaking about false views of the Bible, and then we'll follow that up with Kyle Butt. Uh, why is it so difficult? Why is the Bible so difficult to understand? And so uh, we'll introduce him at the appropriate time, though. But Neil Pollard comes to us from the Lehman Avenue Church of Christ in. Bowling Green, Kentucky, where he has been for a little over a year, and uh, his full introduction is in the book, if you have a copy of that, uh, but he's going to speak to us uh, this morning, Bible, and there are people that view the Bible in all kinds of ways. We've had allusions to this throughout the lectureship uh, in bits and pieces, but we thought it'd be great to have a whole lesson on this. Uh, before Frederick leads us in a prayer, I want to mention, and I'll have this up here, uh, I want to keep a couple of families in our prayers. Uh, we mentioned the Harp family yesterday, and he. Uh, we've had some really good encouraging news on him. Thanks be to God. Uh, he has improved a little. Not not totally out of the woods yet, but uh, he uh, seems to be working toward that. And so let's keep the Harp family in our prayer. Also, Shirley Webb, we've been mentioning Matthew Webb's grandmother, one of our students. Uh, she also seems to be doing as well as can be expected. And so we'll keep that family. And then <clears throat> yesterday we received news that Renee Wheeler's uncle died, Ted and Renee Wheeler. Um, her uncle died, and they were very close. And so we'll keep that family in our prayer as well, the Wheeler family, the Hart family, 
and the Webb family. But we'll have Brother Frederick lead us in that prayer, and then Brother Neil will bring us the lesson. Please, let's bow with me. Thank you so much, Heavenly Father, the most righteous God. At this moment, we come in your presence to thank you. We thank you, O Lord, for your love, your goodness, and your mercy. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die to redeem us from our sins. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the church that he established. We are, we are blessed to be members of his church. We pray, Father, for the school. We give thanks for the school, for for uh, Brian and all the instructors who, who, who spend the time to train men and women for your kingdom. Uh, Father, we, we give thanks to you for, for today, for those speakers. We ask you to be with them. Uh, we, we pray for everyone who listen, Father, those who do not know you, your son Jesus as Lord and Savior, they can accept him before it is eternally too late. We pray for those who are sick, Father. We pray for the Abs family. We, we ask you to be, to be with him. We're so thankful that he's, he's doing better. We pray for, for the uh, Wheeler, uh, uh, the nephew of Brother Wheeler. We ask you to be with him, Father. Please be with us, forgive us for our sins. We pray for everyone we seek, those, those we know about and those we don't know about, Father, we ask you to be with them. Those who are affected by the virus, we ask you to be with them. We pray for those who lost their loved ones, we ask you to strengthen them, to comfort them. Forgive us for our sins, Father. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray you. Amen. Good morning. I just want to say, uh, this being my last time to speak to you this year, how grateful I am for the invitation. And I also want to commend you for what you are doing. Uh, there, uh, it, with this pandemic, there have been a lot of difficult decisions that our brethren have had to make, uh, and we uh, trust that to their uh, judgment and them trying to, to make the best sense of what they can in uh, work in accordance with their local uh, governments. Uh, but I'm so grateful that you have chosen to continue to do this, obviously, uh, in uh, having this lectureship in person throughout uh, an ongoing uh, situation like we have, it's going to impact your attendance. I hope you're not discouraged. I, I want you to know that it's encouraging to those of us who come and are with you to have uh, to see this visible sign of, of your interest uh, despite the difficulties that we labor under right now. I went up to see my mom and dad not long ago and I found a little green booklet that I and my classmates made, uh, and it was decorated by me on the cover with some construction papers, green little book, and it, it uh, said, Cookbook for Mother's Day, 1978. And I remember Mrs. Burroughs was my third grade teacher, and she got all of us in the class to engage in this little pro uh, project in which, without any kind of adult prompting or assistance, that we were to submit for our mothers collectively our favorite recipes. And so we were to write them down as we thought them to be. Well, I had two recipes that I wanted mom to be proud of me and, and sharing and with my profound culinary wisdom. And one was called peanut butter crisbies. And the other one was lemon pie. As it was then, so it is now, I have a big sweet tooth. And I thought those were the ones I wanted to be in there. So as I looked at, uh, at this project of trying to lay down these recipes, the first one was simple, but I believe profound. It was 
Put three cups of Krisbees in a bowl. Add two tablespoons of peanut butter. Four cups of sugar. And bake for 30 minutes at 200. Now the second one was a bit more complex. The one for lemon pie. Take four eggs and three cups of lemon mix, whatever that is, a cup and a half of sugar, and two cups of flour, F-L-O-W-E-R, and bake and pan for an hour at 200 degrees. Well, I had been in the kitchen, you know, at at eight years old. I, I had seen mom in there, and yet I knew nothing about ratios, knew nothing about temperatures, and I really didn't know between uh, an oven or a stovetop, what was to be done for the different recipes. You can only share what you know. Beyond that, you cannot. When I think about what our subject is today and the false views that we have about the Bible, a great deal of, of that confusion and that misunderstanding and that false information that goes out comes because we don't really understand or we cannot navigate through the Bible. When you think about the evangelism that we seek to do, we're trying to share with people what the message of the Bible is. And if we want to see its cohesion and understand something about its message, we do have to properly understand it. You know, I'm grateful to Brother Wendell Winkler who taught uh, one course at Faulkner University called The Scheme of Redemption in which he gives the purpose of the Bible. And I think that it cannot be reduced any better than this. And even though we have 40 different writers writing over 1,600 years, we are seeing one thread as it's being woven throughout Scripture, and that is our salvation being sinners through the person of Christ to the glory of God. And it's important for us to see and understand that God is communicating this message to us. What does it take for us to see the Bible as a credible book? For us to see the Bible as a credible book, we've got to make some assumptions one way or the other. We have to ask ourselves the question, does God have the ability and the willingness to communicate to us? You know, the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows His handiwork. And as we look around at nature and we see the imprint of design, we have to ask ourselves, is there one transcendent being above us, not subject to us, that could give us a a way to communicate His mind and His will that would work for cultures all over the, the world at all times in history? Does He have the ability, as we look at what is seen, to to provide for us something that helps us to know what direction that He wants us to go so that we don't have to grope in the dark and try to figure it out for ourselves? Another question we got to ask is, is God powerful enough to do it? As we see what we're talking about and we look at His power that's exhibited in ways that are quantifiable, does He have the ability? And having the ability, does He have the sort of character that would cause Him to do that for us? And another question we've got to settle in our mind is, who should we believe? Should we believe the transcendent God or should we believe the criticisms of man. In the Bible, you have the most tested, the most assaulted, and the most exonerated book of all time. And people who follow that in cultures of all places and times, as they strive to put their lives in submission to what it teaches, look at the elevation of society and look at the improvement in those people. Or is it the criticisms of men? as they poke holes in what they believe that the Bible is, who its author is, what its origin is, what its message is. And when we listen to what man says, and we follow his philosophy, and we have to say here is a finite, weak, frail being who is assaulting this book, let's let's examine their claims. As we look at them, what happens when we follow man's thoughts and feelings? Does it not lead to misery? and hopelessness, and directionlessness. And so, as we approach the Bible, it will help us. If I can lay us down a brief skeleton, I'd like to then look at about four false views, and then we'll close our lesson. When we see what the Bible's message is, there's a unity of theme throughout. 
As you start in Genesis 1-1 through Genesis 3 and verse 14, the Bible lays out for us immediately that a Messiah is needed, that there is a sin problem that has to be addressed. Man chooses to sin and separates himself from God, and as the result of this needs a Savior. There has to be a way for reconciliation to occur where man can come back to God. And so God leads out with the problem that exists for all of us. And then in Genesis 3 and verse 15, there is a promise. And that promise is that there would be a Messiah that would come. There would be the bridge that would allow man to come back and be reconciled to God. In Genesis chapter 4 and 5, you have laid out the genealogies. That is the family tree through which the Messiah is going to come. And that starts with Adam and goes through Abraham. In Genesis chapter 6 through chapter 9, you have that messianic line that is preserved. You have Noah and his family obeying God, and Noah found grace in the eyes of God, did what God said and uh, was given safety, whereas the world was destroyed. And on the other side of that, God's promise is still intact. In Genesis chapter 10 and Genesis chapter 11, we see more planks on the bridge that lead us ultimately to Christ, who's going to lead us ultimately back to God. And that goes from Noah's son, Shem, all the way down to Abraham. And then we see in the rest of the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 12 through Genesis chapter 50, this messianic line that God has provided, and we see a promise given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We see a messianic nation that's promised. He says, out of your seed, I'm going to make a great nation. And we see that nation beginning to be formed in Exodus chapter 1 through 19 as God sends a deliverer, Moses, to emancipate the people. Let's them go out of Egypt where God is growing them as a people. In Exodus chapter 20 through Deuteronomy, we see a law that's given to them that will govern this Old Testament people of God, these descendants of Abraham. And as they grow as a people being governed and led by God, we see despite Moses' generation being faithless that the next generation, Joshua's generation, goes and conquers the land in the book of Joshua. And this nation promise is fulfilled and God is going to bless them as they're obedient to Him. He's going to curse them as they're disobedient to Him. And they're going to struggle with obeying the message that they're getting from God. And then we see that there's a period of time in which they're guiding themselves. We'll see this later in the lesson. They did what was right in their own eyes. It was characteristic of the period of the judges. And so we have this messianic uh, uh, people, this nation, before it becomes an earthly kingdom that's covered for us in the book of Judges, in Ruth, and into the first Samuel 1 through 8. And then we see the messianic kingdom as it's formed this united kingdom from 1 Samuel chapter 9 through 1 Kings chapter 12 in the reigns of Saul and David and Solomon. And then we see that man cannot stay united because he puts his will above the revealed will of God. And so that kingdom divides. In 1 Kings chapter 12 through 2 Kings chapter 17, we see that beginning with Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And as the kingdom divides, Israel the north, never is faithful to God, never has a king that does anything different from Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. And God sends Isaiah, Hosea, Joel, Jonah, Amos, and Micah, warning them to come back, but they didn't, and they're destroyed in Assyrian captivity at the end of the 8th century. But you have Judah alone after that, and we see them continuing. And in 2 Kings 17 through uh, 2 Chronicles 36, it's the rest of the Old Testament, and it divides around a singular event, the Babylonian captivity, before captivity, during captivity, and after captivity. Before captivity, God sends uh, Jeremiah and Obadiah and Nahum and Habakkuk and Zephaniah saying, don't follow Israel's bad example. And there are a few righteous kings, but ultimately they go into captivity because they're listening to themselves, not to the revealed will of God. For 70 years, they find themselves in Babylonian captivity, and Ezekiel and Daniel are pointing ahead to that better day, that day of reconciliation with Christ when they can be brought back to God. They come back and they have this restoration movement where they're to restore the wall and the law and the temple. And you have Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, and you have Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi who are revealing that for us. Daniel looking ahead through the intertestamental period from Daniel 7 to 12 to talk about the kingdoms that succeed one another until the Roman Empire exists. In Matthew through John, we see the Messiah comes, the one who is the bridge that can bring us back to God. Salvation comes through Him, and the Old Testament has been pointing ahead to that. And the different, uh, the different approaches taken by the different writers writing to different audiences 
Present the perfect life of the Savior who can be the vicarious sacrifice for us and give us the hope of eternal life. And then in the book of Acts, we have the Messianic kingdom as it is established and expanded. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 is the outline uh, that shows us the blueprint of what's to be done by the disciples. And then in Romans through Jude, you have the Messianic kingdom and how you live life in it. How do you conduct yourself in this world that's lost and without a beacon, without a direction? And then the book of Revelation that shows us the messianic kingdom and its eternal destiny. Where we see how the end is going to occur. What's going to happen in the end? We're going to win. Those that overcome can come over. And I take the time to tell you that because we've got to understand that this is a book that man is incapable of producing. And so many of the false views that have come about have come because they failed to see the unity that the Bible has internally. But when we don't see that cohesive factor, there are going to be some false views that we, we come to understand or believe. And let me look at a couple of those. I'm going to divide them into two categories. The first category has to do with the author and the origin of the Bible. And then the second category has to do with the message of the Bible. When we look at first that category of the uh, author and the origin of the Bible, one of the false views that occurs is the idea that the Bible was the product of men. It was not the product of God. The idea is that, that it was written at a, a, a later time. It was written by those who wrote after events occurred that they say were written ahead of time. And that they believe that this is a process that was done by man, either only partially by God or not by God at all. Geisler and Nix tell us that there are some variant views about the origin of the Bible. That there is the view that we might call modernism. And modernism says that the Bible contains the Word of God. That there are some things in the book that uh, seem to be superseding what man is able to do, but that so much of it is the admixture of man coming along at various times in history and claiming to be something more ancient than it is. Now, as we examine this, there is a very fundamental problem with that, and that is that the, the book itself claims to be from God from beginning to end. And so the very book that they're claiming to analyze does not support the claim that they make. That man cannot come along and make additions to it. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 32. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6 says, You are not to add to his word. By the way, modernism has spawned some children. Uh, the idea of postmodernism and uh, an emergent theology, all of which is telling us that God is not the author behind that. We say a whole lot more about that in the book. But the Bible itself dis credits this idea. But there's also the idea with regard to the origin and the message of the Bible that it was written by human authors, that it is not written by man, I mean by God at all, but it was written by men. And there's two different categories, of course, we can look at the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's something that is referred to often as the documentary hypothesis that takes those first five books of the Bible and disclaims Moses as the author of them. The reason why they say this is because there are various words or concepts that are covered in those five books uh, of Genesis through Deuteronomy that show us or at least seem to hint to them that there must be different writers. There's what they call the Jehovahistic writings and they will mark that with a J, the J documents or the, the J writings that they believe to be more ancient, that they go back to the 9th century B.C. And you'll notice as you look through the Pentateuch and throughout the Old Testament, and maybe in your translation it's in all capital letters, that uh, tetragrammaton Y-H-W-H that is transliterated as Jehovah with the vowels of Adonai. And they say that these are more ancient, maybe to the 9th century B.C., and, and it's indicated by the writer, they presume perhaps Moses, who uses that particular name for God. But a little later writing that comes along in the 8th century, the, 
uh, uh, the uh, Elohimistic books, uh, is the E, written in the 8th century because the name of Elohim is used instead of Jehovah in those particular passages. And then there's the Deuteronomic uh, documents or writings or portions of the Pentateuch or those first five books uh, in the, which they deal with law matters. And this, they would say, would be about the time of Josiah in the 7th century. And then there are the priestly matters, the P documents, and these would be the latest documents of all in dealing with these priestly laws that later scribes would come along and write in the 5th century B.C. after the captivity and they've returned. The J.E.D.P. This theory, though, does not consider that Moses was dealing with different things when, God, when Moses writes, as he claims to do throughout the Pentateuch, and when we look at canonicity and we look at inspiration, the, those books are books that were authored by God and were only recognized by the people of God. They did not determine that they belonged in the book. You have Moses dealing with the nature and the character of God and at times is dealing with that self-existent, that uncaused cause of God. And then he's dealing with this great power and thus he uses the different names of God. And certainly we see the different aspects of God that are introduced as it is with Hagar. Then there are times when he needs to deal with law matters throughout the generations of time. And then the duties of the priest and giving the sacrificial system. Moses was no dummy. Moses was brought up in, as the daughter of Pharaoh, according to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 24, would have been the most literate of his day. He was no lightweight. He could have delivered the Bible as he said that he did. And so in trying to... Uh, understand and reconcile, instead of accepting that the Bible is what it claims to be, the inspired Word of God, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, they come up with this false view of the Bible. And then they take the writings of later prophets, like Isaiah, and they, they come up with this idea that two individuals, at least, at least uh, uh, Isaiah, the prophet in Isaiah 1 through 39, would have written some of the early chapters, but some of the future prophecies that are made in chapters 40 through 66 could not have been the product of Isaiah, but had to have been a later writer and ascribed it to him in chapters 40 through 66. But an interesting proof is found for us in the New Testament. You have two gospel writers who do the incredible. Mark does it. Mark chapter 1 and verse 2, Mark quotes Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. And then in Mark chapter 7 and verse 6, he quotes Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 29 and verse 13 and sees them as the same individual. But even more firmly proven for us is what happens in John 12, 38 through 41, where John in the singular context shows Jesus teaching. And in John 12 and verse 38, he says, this is what was said by the prophet Isaiah and quotes Isaiah 53 and verse 1. And then in verse 39 and 40, he looks at the prophet Isaiah again says, and then he quotes Isaiah chapter 6 in verse 10, and just to make sure that we won't miss it, in verse 41, he says, These things said Isaiah the prophet regarding his glory. What things? Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 1 and Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 10, Jesus saw both sections as having one writer. You know, the book of Daniel has often been discredited by the critics because of the miracles that are depicted therein, whether it's the fiery furnace or Daniel in the lion's den or the disembodied hand that's writing. And so they try to discount that and say that later uh, writers would have come along and written that. But an incredible thing happens for us. When Jesus in Matthew 24 and verse 15 refers to Daniel, chapter 11 and verse 31, and he accredits that to being Daniel the prophet, our Lord and Savior, says that's Daniel. Now here's the thing. It's fair for us to ask, who should we believe? Should we believe 19th and 20th and now 21st century critics who come to the Bible already with a destructive idea that this could not have been the product of an almighty God? Or do we go back 2,000 years in time where these ones who write for us and preserve for us in the New Testament, the words of those who look back at the Old Testament, they were two millennia closer to the writers than the critics today. And so then we go to the New Testament. 
And there's what's often called the synoptic problem, where you have especially the writings of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And, and if you ever study that, sometimes you have the synoptic studies, a, a study Bible that will go between those three books especially because there's material found there that you don't necessarily see in John. And John records some things that are not in those other three. And so the theory that has emerged from that is that, there, that uh, Mark was the oldest of those three and that Matthew and Luke would have borrowed and copied from them and this unknown source called Q as, as well as some other special traditions and that that's how they derive their material. But what it fails to see is that you have writers from the same general time frame who are writing about the incredible works of the same man to the same people at the same time. And another thing that's missed is that each of those four Gospels are written to unique audiences with unique purposes of those books. There are unique keywords and emphases. It's hard, I suppose, for critics of the Bible to simply take the Bible at its word. That it is and that it's a credible claim given the unity that we've already seen that these are books that came from God. But then when it comes to the message of the Bible, it's interesting to see what has been done with that. And this sometimes, certainly not by agnostics or atheists, uh, oftentimes theologians, those who are filling pulpits and, and classrooms and places of higher education, they say something that really all boils down to being an accommodation of our culture. As they see, uh, certainly, culture is changing all the time. How do you reconcile? How do you deal with that? Let me tell you, as a local preacher, I've been preaching full-time since 1992, and the issues that we dealt with then are different from the issues that we deal with now. And I mean by that on a moral plane. As I sat in a Bible classroom as, as a young student tr training to preach, there was no way that our professors could have gotten up and said, all right, there's going to be this thing called transgenderism that you're going to have to deal with, and here's what the Bible has to say about that. And really, to the degree that it has occurred, there was no way for them to adequately address for us the idea that homosexuality would become such a norm in society that gay marriage would be legalized along the way. There are changes in the culture that could not have been foreseen. Certainly, I, don't, I can't foresee a professor who would look ahead and say that there was going to be a, a pandemic in 2020 that was going to cause such dissension and division on so many different levels. But those who come with a very critical eye to the Scriptures say, well, look, don't, don't trouble yourself anyway because that, that was written for a different culture and a different time. It fails to see that God in His foresight, the God who has created it all, could have the flexibility that His words would be applicable to all people of all times. And the problem is when you don't have an anchor in which to set yourself, you find yourself ever adrift. As these changes occur and they continue to unravel the fabric of society, as has been done, then the religious authorities continue to change their view of what Scripture teaches. It's a recipe for disaster and destruction. Proverbs meant in Proverbs 14, 34, where righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a reproach to any people. When man tries to make life a self-guided tour, it's destined to end in that way. God had the foresight. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may uh, be thoroughly furnished for every good work, being adequate. Jude 3 says that the faith was delivered once for all times. When we see what man wants to do with the ever-shifting sands, of man's moral inclinations. What we have in Scripture is a superior model that we can go to the Word of God and find that which in principle applies for all people of all times. Another false view of the Bible is that the Bible ultimately is subordinate to my feelings. I know what the Bible says, but I feel this way. It says X, but I believe Y. I wouldn't trade this feeling for a stack of Bibles. Oh, I know that the Bible says this, but the Holy Spirit told me. You know, the Bible is filled with warnings about this very approach. In Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 5, the counsel of the wicked is deceitful. 
Twice in Proverbs 14, 12 and Proverbs 16, verse 25, the Bible says that the, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Jeremiah 10, verse 23, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his steps. In Romans chapter 1, verse 28, God allows man to go the way he wants if he gives up a belief in God. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 11 and verse 12, there is a delusion that can occur that can cause us to believe that which is false instead of what is true. You know, when we come to our examination of Scripture, we look at passages like John chapter 12 and verse 48 where Jesus says, The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge you in the last day. Or Revelation 20 and verse 12, when the Bible says for itself, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, and the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the books according to their works, we might ask ourselves, which words? The words of J-E, D, or P? The words of which Isaiah? The words of Q? You see, there are implications to the positions that are taken. And one who believes himself to be following in his own steps finds himself walking on shifting sand. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. Read about a woman named Ashley Despain. She decided to go visit her boyfriend in his jail, at the, at the jail in Nevada, Missouri, and she brought him a Bible. Isn't that wonderful? She wanted her boyfriend to have a Bible and maybe learn the Word of God, but no, what she did was in the binding of the Bible, she put marijuana and methamphetamine. What an ingenious way for her to get the, the, the drugs into his hands. The officials there said, we've seen folks try to smuggle drugs in a lot of different ways, but it's the first time that they ever used the Bible to do that. She reduced the value of this book infinitely. Those who have changed the message of Scripture have sought to do the same thing. They have reduced the great value that it holds. When we look at the Bible and understand why it was written, it was written to give us the guidance that we desperately want. When we come to understand that those of such diverse background could come together and they could write independent of one another, a book that so perfectly guides us to understand where we came from, why we're here, and where we're going. We see that this is a book man is incapable of producing, and it gives us a more reverent and honorable view of God's Word. May we hold to that and then get out there and share that with the world around us. But uh, yet we know that the Bible can stand for itself, and it does. And so we appreciate Neil bringing that out for us. We ask Brother Tim Simmons uh, to lead us in a song. And if you'd like to stand and stretch for that song, and then afterward I will introduce our next speaker. One fifty four, one five four. Give me the Bible. One fifty four. Me the Bible, star of gladness gleaming to cheer the wanderer, lone and tempest tossed. No storm can hide that radiance peaceful beaming since Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Give me the
<clears throat> Kyle Butt uh, comes to us from the Montgomery, Alabama area, where he has been working with Apologetics Press since the year 2000. And I'll just say up front before we get started that he is, his chapter was part of the lost chapters of the lectureship book. Uh, and so we have the supplement here, as we mentioned, uh, pages 129 through 190 something were typed over with somebody else's lectureship for some, some, somehow or another. But um, here's a legit copy right in here. Of course, the electronic version, nothing wrong with that. It's all there as it ought to be. Uh, and this lesson, Why is the Bible so difficult to understand, is actually uh, from an article that was in Reason and Revelation in April of 2020. And uh, we get this at the school. I came across that as I was uh, putting together the final touches of the lectureship. And I thought, wow, that would be great for the lectureship because it's right along with what we're talking about. And so he agreed to let us have that article. We edited it kind of to fit our format. Uh, but this is a lesson that he will bring to us today. It's a tremendous lesson. And so without any further delay, Brother Kyle Butt. Have you stopped beating your wife? It's a tricky question, isn't it? In fact, if you take that question as it's presented to you and decide you're going to try to answer it with a yes or no, which seems to be what people are asking in that particular question, you're going to have a problem because if you say yes, well, what does it sound like you were doing in the past? Beating your wife. If you say no, what does it sound like you are still doing? Well, beating your wife. And so the idea of have you stopped beating your wife is a question that needs to be discussed and altered before you ever even suggest you're going to give an answer to it. What you might say in response to that particular question is, hold on just a second, I don't like how that question's worded. I've never beaten my wife and I certainly don't now, so let's then have that discussion. But you just can't answer it how it's presented. Now, like Brother Kenyon said, I work at Apologetics Press, deal with skeptics and unbelievers quite often, and many times they'll come to us and they'll say, okay, so you claim that the Bible is the Word of God, and you claim that God is a loving God. Well, if that's the case, then why in the world would a loving God write such a confusing book that if you drive down any given street in the United States of America, you will see 20 different congregations of groups that call themselves Christians or something of the like, and they're all claiming to read the same Bible, and yet they don't agree on what they believe, and they fight each other about certain interpretations? Why is the Bible so hard to understand? Now, here's why we're almost tempted to answer the question like it's presented. Because we've read the Bible. And we've run across some stuff that is hard to understand. And so at first, when they say, why is the Bible hard to understand? Then our mind goes immediately to one or two of those passages like the man of sin or various different passages that we've struggled with in our minds. And we think, yeah, it is. Well, let me explain to you why the Bible's hard to understand. But we need to put the brakes on the answer, I think, and ask ourselves the real question. Is the Bible in its entirety hard to understand? Well, the answer to that is no. I mean, we've got kids' classes where we're teaching five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds a large portion of what the Bible says, and they're understanding it perfectly. The idea of the various narratives in the Bible that kids can certainly readily take in and understand exactly what's going on when the angel appears to the shepherds during the birth of Jesus and calls, tells them what's happening there in that, well, Bethlehem. And as that narrative goes through, that's easy for kids to understand. The crucifixion, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, not hard to understand. The idea of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Well, that's easy to understand. God says, let there be light, there is light. Not difficult at all. And so if we were just to say, is the Bible hard to understand? No. The answer to that question is no. Are some parts of the Bible hard to understand? Now, the answer to that is yes. Some parts are hard to understand. In fact, if you were to go to 2 Peter 
and you look in chapter 3, you will hear Peter talk about Paul's writings. And there at the end, um, right at the end of chapter 3, he says, and Paul talks about these things in all of his writings as he does, in which are some things which are hard to understand, which those who are untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the rest of the Scriptures. Now, what's the implication of Peter's statement in his discussion with Paul? Paul writes some stuff that's hard to understand. Now, those who are untaught and unstable, they twist those hard things to their own destruction as they do the rest of the Scriptures, the rest of the Scriptures that are what? Easy to understand. And so what he's saying is, okay, whether it's hard or whether it's easy, those people who are untaught and unstable, they're going to twist them all. So not only do they twist the hard parts that are there, but they twist the easy parts too. So let's not pretend that, oh, hey, if they come to an easy part, then they're going to understand it correctly and accept it for what it's saying, and just the hard parts trip them up. No, 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 they're twisting them all. But the implication is, but a bulk of them, most of them, are not hard to understand. You know, to me, it's very much like the study of physics. Now, if you were to ask, is the study of phys physics complicated? Is it hard? Why is physics so difficult to understand? Well, hold on just a second. Now, if you're trying to deal with acceleration rates of gravity and the subatomic particle movement of the X or Y, you're going to get into some heady stuff. But does a five-year-old know physics enough to stay alive for a day? I mean, you know you don't dive headfirst into concrete. You know you don't step off a 20-story building. You know that walking in front of a fast-moving car will hurt you. Now, you might not know all the mechanics behind why a fast-moving car and you don't need to meet at the same point in space and time, but you know it doesn't need to happen. And so when we look at, is the Bible hard to understand, we come to the conclusion that no, much of the Bible is very easy to understand and we can understand it absolutely enough to get everything that God wants us to know about. Just like a kid can understand physics enough not to jump off a 20-story building, whether or not he or she knows that the acceleration rate of gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. He doesn't have to know that. He just has to know, that's not something I need to do. Now, the second aspect of this idea of the Bible being hard to understand, most of it is not hard. Some of it is hard. So the next question is, well... If some is hard, then how could a loving God expect people who aren't very well acquainted with the Scripture or who might not have had as much opportunity as another person, how can God expect them to know everything about the Bible? He never has. God's never expected a person who doesn't have the ability or opportunity to know as much about the Bible as someone who has had the capability and opportunity. Now, let's see if the Scripture bears that out. When you go to the book of Hebrews and you start to read about where the Hebrews should have been in their maturity, well, the Hebrews writer tells them that by this time you ought to be teachers. What was their moral obligation at the point in time where the Hebrews writer was writing to them? They had had the opportunity and the capability to have been teachers but they had not progressed like they should have. They weren't understanding the Bible like they should have been understanding the Bible, even though they had the capability and the opportunity. He said, by this time you ought to be te teachers, but now you need somebody to teach you again the first principles of the faith. And then he went on to explain that those who are mature in the Scripture can handle the meat of the Word and not just the milk, and by reason of use have their senses trained to do this. You know, it's something that you have to progress into. But a brand new Christian who has just come into any type of understanding of the Bible, does God expect that person to know as much as somebody who's been in the Lord's church for 40 years and has had the capability and opportunity to study the Bible that whole time? No. Never has. And when you look there in 1 Peter, and you go to 1 Peter chapter 2, about verses 2 and following, he says, As newborn babes desire the sincere, the pure milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby. Okay, you know, last time I saw somebody stick a T-bone steak in front of a three-year-old with a fork and knife, 
Well, that was a mistake. Well, I don't know if I've ever seen that, really. So it's just not something that you do. Why? Because, you know, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, well, they're not, they're, they're not eating T-bone steak with a fork and knife. Now, you put John Farber in front of a T-bone steak with a fork and knife, and, I mean, it's going to get handled fairly quickly. God's never expected us to understand any more than we're capable of understanding or have had the opportunity to understand. And so now let's get into our question. The question of why is the Bible so hard to understand? Well, hold on just a second. The Bible is not hard to understand. Some parts are. Well, then does God expect me to understand everything about the Bible? No, He only expects you to understand what you have had the capability and opportunity to understand. But what are the reasons people misunderstand the Bible? You know, it's really fairly self-explanatory why much of the Bible is misunderstood. The first reason that I would give why people misunderstand the Bible. It's not profound. It's not anything that is, you know, just, okay, I can't, yeah, thanks for telling us that, Kyle. I never had thought of that. Uh, the first reason I give for why people misunderstand the Bible is, well, in the United States of America, 90% of people in the country have a Bible. 90% of homes have one Bible in them, at least. 40% of those homes have four or more different Bibles in them. It's the number one best-selling book of every single week, every single month, every single year, and has been as long as any records have been kept. Right now in the United States, Bible publishers sell about $500 million worth of Bibles. It's been distributed in whole to the tune of about 10 billion copies. And if you were just to take the parts of it, like if someone just prints a New Testament or just prints the book of John or something like that, you're talking about the tens of scores of billions. And so George Gallup, in his look at what the United States of America thinks about the Bible, he says that Americans revere the Bible. They respect it. Well, I think we're seeing that fall off some presently, but by and large, as a whole, Americans revere the Bible. And so then he just started asking some questions. Okay, so you revere the Bible. That's great. Uh, who were Sodom and Gomorrah? Good question. 50% uh, of the graduates graduating high school in the United States of America said they were a married couple. All right, 85% of the people who were asked say that this is a Bible verse. God helps those who help themselves. 12% of the people who were asked said that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. Well, more, we've got the same last name there, Noah's Ark, Joan of Arc. I mean, I don't know why Joan of Arc. About 50% of the people who were asked couldn't name the first four Gospels in the New Testament in order, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I think about 50% couldn't name a single Old Testament prophet. And several people thought that Billy Graham preached the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, and so George Gallup said, in the United States of America, the Bible is revered, but it is not read. And because it is not read, we have become a nation of biblical illiterates. Well, yeah, one of the main reasons that people don't understand the Bible is they haven't read it. Now, here's what happens in, I think, even our churches. I remember as a young preacher, you know, last year. I mean, I, it was not long ago, and no, it was a little while back. And I had gone into this particular congregation, and I was, it was a youth rally we were doing, and I was going to do a little mixer which you would write things on the paper that they would have to go talk to somebody else to get an answer to. And so if you're wearing purple socks today, go find someone with purple socks. If you've ever been to Disney World, go find somebody who's been to Disney World. And so you would get them to write their name on that particular line of the piece of paper. And I thought it would be real easy to do, so I just put, uh, if you've read the Bible. And so the kid who's reading this just goes, tries to find somebody who's read the Bible. So where do you think you go if you've read the Bible? Well, if the preacher's there probably. I mean, we pay him to read his Bible, don't we? So when you go to the preacher, and well, the preacher couldn't sign it. And so where do you go next, which you probably should have gone to first? Because, well, the elders certainly have read their Bible, wouldn't you think? And so they went to the elder of the congregation. He hadn't read the Bible. The line was long behind the one or two people that could actually sign that particular line of having read the Bible. 
Now, here's the thing. It takes you 72 hours, standard pulpit speed, to read the Bible. We're on our phones on average three hours a day. That's 21 hours a week. It would take you basically four weeks to read the Bible if we got off our phones. And yet some of us have been in the Lord's Church for 10, 15, 20 years, and if a kid came up to us and said, have you read your Bible? The answer to that would be no. And then we get this. Well, you know, I start reading my Bible. This is just so hard to understand. I, I don't read it. Oh, do you know why you don't understand it? Because you don't read it. You can't understand anything of any importance unless you read it. Why does the stockbroker, who is a successful stockbroker, know when to buy a particular stock, sell a particular stock, what this company is going to do, what that company is going to do? Why? Because he studies it. Why does the, the mega super couponer know how to get this one coupon, and you can use it 27 times if it's the third day of the second month when the moon was this way, and at this store you get 17 of these free if you will put a penny on top of the coupon when you slide it under the register. Now, how do they know that? I mean, you've got to study that stuff. It's written there. It's the small print, but it's there. Everything of any importance that a person wants to take into their mind has to be studied. You have to read it. Is it any surprise that people don't understand the Bible when they don't read it? You know, I was watching a video in 2012. There was a group called the Atheist Agenda. And they were putting, oh, uh, it was an event that they did on this particular weekend. They called it Smut for Smut. And they said, hey, we'll swap you a pornographic magazine for any religious book, especially the Bible, because we think that what's in the Bible is just about equal to a pornographic magazine. Now, they weren't having much success as far as that went. I think ultimately this weekend they only swapped out eight magazines or so. It was probably a failure by their standards, and I can see exactly why that would be the case. But you had one young man who was standing opposite of the table. It was on top of a stairway there at the University of Texas in San Antonio, and it was one of the main thoroughfares where people would walk on campus. And this guy's holding this sign. And the sign basically says the Bible is God's word and what these atheists are saying about it is not true. Well, and the atheist comes over to him and they're the, one I think, they're the ones I think who have posted the video. It's on YouTube there. And he walks over to this guy and he says, so you're a Christian, basically? And the guy's like, yeah. So you believe the Bible? And the guy says, yeah. He says, have you read it in its entirety? Well, the guy drops his head and he starts folding up his sign. And he says, no. And starts trying to walk away. Well, you, of course, the atheist is not going to let him walk away from that. And he follows him. He says, well, the parts that you hadn't read are the parts that are filled with immoralities. And, and just choose him up one side and down the other. And this man, this young man, student, looked like college-age student, probably a fellow student there on the University of Texas campus trying to defend the Bible, and hadn't even read it. Now, you know, some people say, well, Kyle, I'm just not a good reader. I'm say, okay, don't make an excuse. And here's what I mean by that. The Bible understands that many of the people that heard it in the first century weren't even literate. And when Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, he said, until I come give attention to reading, your English standard writes that, until I come give attention to public reading, what did Ezra do when he stood up on that platform that was made for the purpose and he opened the book and he read it to all who had understanding? Is it the case that, okay, maybe you can't read. Maybe you have a disability. Maybe you can't even see. Maybe you take your information in audibly. Okay, however you take it in. What the Bible is saying is not that you have to put eyes on a page, although that's a great way to do it, but you have to get God's Word into your mind. God's Word. Not what somebody else says about God's Word, not what somebody else thinks about God's Word. You've got to get God's Word into your mind. Now, I think one of the neatest things in the world is Audible, where you can get the entire Bible on your phone, and you can press play and listen to that. As, and what I like about it is, you know, sometimes I get the... I don't know, I'm, I'm a Stephen Johnson, New King James voice only man myself and have been listening to that for years. But Stephen Johnson likes to make sure that every syllable is mentioned. Well, that's slow as Christmas to me. And I fall asleep in about the first, in the beginning. 
Well, on Audible, you can crank it to as fast as you want it to go. You can do 1.25 speed, you can do 1.5 speed, you can do 1.75 speed, and in Chronicles, you can do 2.0 speed and get through some of those genealogies pretty fast. And you know what? You're, the human mind, they say, can listen to something and process something four times as fast as most people speak. And so you start getting used to two times. And while I was, I was on two, you know, two speed, and you know, it sounds like the chipmunks kind of are talking to them. And like, if you're not used to it, my, my truck picks it up automatically. And so I had a buddy that was driving with me, got in, and my truck grabs the, whatever's playing on my phone and started playing it. And I was just sitting there to listen to it. And he's like, how fast do you listen to this? And I said, oh, yeah, I'm, I, I figured that. Well, all I'm saying is when you start listening to it like that, you can pick it up very, very easy. So here's what I'm telling you. 72 hours, that's standard pulpit speed. You could get it down to 50 hours and still be understanding all of it. What's the point? Get it into your mind. Now, here's the next reason I think a lot of people misunderstand the Bible. The old point and flip method. They say, okay, I'm going to read my Bible. And they do. They, they read their Bible fairly often, just not in any type of systematic way. And so they'll be laying in their bed at night and they'll be like, oh, I wonder what God has to say to me tonight. And they'll flip it open and punch their finger and start reading right there. Well, I wonder what God's saying to me tonight. Next night, they'll flip it over and they'll point the finger and start reading right there, and they think they're reading the Bible. Okay, that is reading the Bible, but if you read the Bible in an unsystematic way like that, you're going to run into some very serious trouble. Here's why. Because let's say you flip over to the book of Job, and you happen to hit your finger right down on Eliphaz's first sermon. Eliphaz's first sermon says, When has anybody ever seen righteous people suffer? That doesn't happen. Oh, Really? Well, I think we understand from the story of Jesus and Job being a precursor to what Jesus is going through that no righteous people do suffer. But if you pop down right in the first, the first speech of Eliphaz, you're going to stop in the righteous person never suffers and is never cut off. Well, and then Job comes back and says, well, hold on just a second. I'm righteous and I'm getting some serious pain into my life. And so at the end of the book of Job, maybe you'll remember that God comes to Job and says, your three friends didn't say anything right. And if you'll pray for them, I'll forgive them, but they weren't right. Guess what? The book of Job, one-third of it is Job's three friends talking nonsense. Well, if you flip through and happen to point at Job 40, Job 27, 2 or whatever, don't quote me on that. I, don't, I mean, I don't, I don't have the Neil Pollard verse quote as well as, as I need to, but whatever it is, and it's Eliphaz or Bildad or Zophar, okay, that's wrong. Uh, try the flip and point method in the book of Ecclesiastes. See how that works for you. Uh, I hated my life because of the work that was done under the sun. You don't get the point of Ecclesiastes until the last verse, basically. So if you don't get to that, the point and flip is going to throw you in all kinds of misdirection. All right, so that's kind of point 1B, but point 1 is people don't understand the Bible because they don't read it. Point 1B or point 2 is they read it, but not in any kind of systematic way. Now, let's try that. In any other idea where you need information, you get your new phone, and you want to know how to put a voice message on it. You have the manual, the phone manual, and you think, I'm going to try to, try to put my voice message on this phone. And you stop right there, and it says, you know, press button 3 for whatever. Well, if you're not under the section of voicemail, putting your whatever on it, it's going to be totally off. It's not going to give you what you're looking for. The point and flip method is not going to be any type of legitimate systematic study of how you can get stuff done on your phone. So why in the world would we think it would be a legitimate systematic study of how we can improve our spiritual well-being? Well, it's just not. You can't say, hey, I read the Bible. I just don't read it at all, and I don't read it in any systematic way. I just kind of take in what the Lord's given me. Well, the Lord gave it all to you. And so take it all in and systematically study it. All right. First one, people don't read it. Second one, people don't read it systematically. The third reason I think that people misunderstand the Bible, and this one is very common, is that there are false teachers to whom they listen instead of listening to what the Bible says. And the Bible mentions this on any number of occasions. You read that the Jews who were trying to stand up against Paul in his preaching had poisoned the minds of those to whom Paul was preaching. 
Paul explains to Timothy that in latter times, the Holy Spirit has promised that some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving doctrines and demon doctrines, basically things that we know are wrong, but that they will be teaching. You know, lots of times people want to sit in a pew or a chair or something and say, hey, tell me what the Bible says. You know, and that's why those who in Berea were more noble than those who were in Thessalonica, because they searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so or not. I'll never forget Brother Jerry Jenkins, and the preacher there at the Roebuck congregation for, I think, about 42, 43 years, and he was in charge of the Maywood camp for many years, had been one of the ground level, basically got Maywood going. And he stood up at Maywood the week I was there, and he said, uh, how many of you would believe that this Bible is 14 inches long? And of course, we're looking at it. We all got a pretty good concept of, of what 14 inches would be. And we said, no, 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 that Bible can't be 14 inches long. So nobody raised their hand. He said, yeah, you're right. Of course, you look at this Bible and it's not 14 inches long. And he said, how could we find out how long this Bible is? And somebody said, well, you need a ruler. He's like, yeah, you need a standard, don't you? You can't just make up inches for this Bible, you need a standard. So he pulled out a ruler, and he took that ruler, and he put it on the Bible, and he looked down, and he said, nine inches. Now how many of you would think that this Bible is nine inches long? Everybody raised their hand. He said, you're all wrong. And he put that ruler down on that Bible and asked a person to come up off the front row and look at it himself. And the Bible was eight inches long. And he said, if you let someone tell you how long the Bible is without looking at it for yourself, well, then lots of times that will get you in serious trouble. Well, we think, oh, he's getting the standard. He's, once, once you got that standard on it, then it's... No, no, once you look at the standard for yourself is the point at which you are the one who now knows what the text says. You know, I love to hear good gospel preaching, but how do you know it's good gospel preaching? If you listen to what's said and then you search the Scriptures daily to make sure that what a person is saying and what a person is doing coincides with what God, God's Word says. And guess what? Like Brother Pollard said, John chapter 12, verse 48, He who rejects me and does not receive my word... I do not judge him. He has one that judges him on the last day. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. Here's what that means. There is no pop quiz. There's no new information. There's no secret code that you need to know to get to the message of the Bible, Paul said to the Ephesians. There in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2, he said, By revelation, God delivered to me the mystery of Jesus Christ, which I have written to you, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. You know what Paul said? Okay, God gave it to me. I gave it to you. Now you and I both know the same. You read it. You know exactly what I know about the mystery of Jesus Christ. It's right there. That's, there's no secret code. And on the day of judgment, there's not going to be, well, my preacher said, you know, my mama always said, my old pappy used to tell me, none of that. You know what's going to be there? The Word of God and your life and how your life corresponds to what God said is the only thing that's going to matter. And you're not going to be able to say, well, I didn't know that. Well, why? Because I listened to somebody else and they told me this. It doesn't matter. That's not who was going to be judging you at the last day. So some people don't read it. Some people read it unsystematically. Some people let other people tell them what it says and they don't find out for themselves. Now I'm going to give you a couple real practical ones that we're going to have to hustle through. Sometimes you get a bad translation. And you've just got to understand that and work through that. Give me an example. If you return to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, you're going to, if you've got an old King James, going to be in trouble. Now, I like the old King James. Uh, lots of times I, I use the old King James, King James, Kyle Butt translation, where I'll have about just eight words from the old King James, a couple from the new, and I might have done a little word study on one or two myself, and I'll put that in there. You've got Acts chapter 2, and you look at about verse 31. Talking about David, he foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in... Well, what's your old King James say right there? Yeah, your old King James says hell. 
Now, hell is just a bad translation. We know that Jesus' soul never went to hell. We know that on the cross when he was talking to the thief who was the penitent thief who recognized Jesus as a king even though he was hanging on a cross and said, remember me when you come into your kingdom, that Jesus said to him, this day your soul will be with me in paradise. Well, so how is it that the text translates this, that Jesus' soul is in hell, and that misunderstanding has caused all kinds of various wrong doctrines to pop up about how somehow Jesus went to hell and preached to people who were in hell, and there's a place that a good, righteous soul could go hell, but somehow they could get back out of that, etc. Well, the problem there is the word is simply Hades. And the word Hades just means the realm of the dead. And there are two sections in Hades, torment and paradise. And you read about that in Luke chapter 16 where you have the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man goes to Hades and in torment lifts up his eyes and sees Lazarus who is in Hades but in Abraham's bosom. And so that idea of Hades just means the rim of the dead. You get a bad translation there and you're going to read that. I remember I was uh, in a class and they were talking about Samson and how Samson had had problems there with that woman that he had wanted to marry, and she was given to his best man at the wedding, and so he came back in and brought a kid to her. Well, then this teacher had stood up and said, and that kid was from the relationship that they had had, and he was bringing the baby back to this woman, and I mean, he was just going all through it. The word kid means a baby goat. And he had just misunderstood the translation of it. And so sometimes you run into a bad translation or it needs to trying to say you can misunderstand. Might misunderstand really know what's happening with this particular custom. I'll give you an example of that. James, diverse weights and diverse weights to the Lord. Now what in the world does that mean? I mean, why does God hate different measures? I mean, does that mean, okay, if this person measures something and it's 12 inches and this person over here measures something, God hates the difference between 12 inches and 11 inches. You know, you look at that and you just think, what's the deal there? Bags of weights that had the same number on them, but weighed something different. And so here's what we mean by that. You'd have the buying bag and the selling bag. Okay, so somebody comes to you and says, hey, I want to sell you a pound of grain. Okay, so you grab your buying bag of weights and you pull out the one that says one pound and I'd like to buy that. And so you put your one pound weight up there and he sells you one pound of grain and you get 1.2 pounds. Then a seller comes up and says, I'd like to buy a pound of grain. And you say, oh, okay. So you buy, you pull out your selling bag and you've got one pound and you put one pound from your selling bag, and your one pound from your selling bag is actually 0.8. So you sell this person, and now you're, you bought a pound, and you still almost got half a pound of grain left. Well, how is that? Well, you've got different weights in the same bag, and you pull out the one that is beneficial to you. What's the proverb writer saying? Don't cheat people. Fraud's bad. Dishonesty is not good in any culture. That was an example of their dishonesty. But if you don't know what diverse weights and diverse measures are, then you got no idea what's happening in that particular context. So some people don't read it. Some people don't read it systematically. Some people let other people tell them what it says instead of read it themselves. Sometimes you get a bad translation that needs some adjustment. Sometimes you don't understand the customer culture. I see Brian's about to walk up here. I see you, Brian. I see you. I, I know you're going right there. I don't have time to finish, but I do want to get to this. You just can't tell under that. Um, that we absolutely need to understand 
and fight very strenuously against that we are all tempted to do. Is some people say they want to understand it, but they don't really want to know what it says. Now, I'm going to send you to a passage that I don't know. I, th- I, I guess I have read it or heard it or seen it probably scores of times, and it never dawned on me what was going on. It's in Jeremiah chapter 42. We're not going to have time to look at all the verses that I'd like to. But you have the fact that Gedaliah was set up as the king for the remnant of the Israelites. And a guy by the name of Ishmael comes and kills Gedaliah after the Babylonians had set him up as king. And so all the rest of the people there in Judah are wondering what we need to do. So they come to Jeremiah and they say, will you And Jeremiah, they're right at the beginning of chapter 42. Look at verse 4. He says that whatever the Lord answers you, I will bring back to you. I'll go ask God, and I'll tell you exactly what God says. Now, these guys look like they are exactly what you would want in people who are trying to follow God. Look at the next verse in verse 6. Whether it is pleasing or displeasing, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we go with us when we obey the voice of the Lord God. So what do they say? Whatever God says, whatever He says, we'll do it. Man, that's awesome. You, hey, I just want to know what God says. Whatever God says, we'll do it. If you're talking to a person that says, you just show me where it is in the Bible and I'll do it. Does that sound awesome? Yeah, so Jeremiah goes. He stays 10 days. He prays. God sends him the message. The message is, don't go to Egypt. Do not go to Egypt. Whatever else you do, don't go to Egypt. You stay in the land of Judah. God will take care of you. Don't go to Egypt. That's the message. Now look at verse 20. Jeremiah says, y'all aren't going to do it. For you were hypocrites in your hearts when you sent me to the Lord your God, saying, pray for us to the Lord our God, and according to all that the Lord our God says, so declare to us. Now you go down to chapter 43, 1. Now when Jeremiah had stopped speaking, Azariah the son of Hoshea, Jehonan the son of Kareah, and all the proud men spoke, saying, You speak falsely. The Lord has not said that. Hey, we'll do whatever God says until He says it. And it's something we don't want to do. You know, I'll never forget this. There was a preacher friend of mine who was studying with a man who believed that you didn't have to be baptized to be saved, believed it didn't have anything to do with salvation, and basically said the Bible never says that baptism has anything to do with salvation. And so my friend took him over to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, and said, do you mind reading that passage? And the man said, sure. There's also an antitype with the, which doth also not save us, namely baptism. Now, and my preacher friend let him finish the reading, and he said, hold on just a second. Would you mind reading that one more time? There's also an antitype which doth also not save us, not the removal. Third time. My friend said, would you, would you mind reading that one more time? And there's also an antitype which doth also not. I believe it was three times he included the word not in the text. But the text says there is also an antitype which doth also now. Save us. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Now, most people don't actually change the words in their mind to fit with what they believe, but they come to the text believing something, and they're just looking for validation of what they already believe, and they don't really care what God says, and they just pick and choose whatever goes along with what they already say and what they already believe, and when they run into something that goes against it, they don't really... Well, they just don't want to hear that. And I think the challenge for all of us is to sit down with our Bibles and honestly say to God, I want to know what you have to say to me, whether that means I need to change everything about my life, whether that means I need to go somewhere I've never gone before, whether that means I need to stop saying something I've said for the last 40 years of my life. Whatever you want me to do, God, please help me see in your word what I need to do to obey you. And I think if we all come to the text with that attitude, 
Well, we will get to go away having been uplifted and built up by the Word of God, which is able to save our souls. Thank you very much for letting me be with you. us to uh, meet the cost of the lectureship. That would be a great blessing to all of us, and so we would appreciate that help if you could give it. Let us go to God in prayer. Loving God and gracious Father, we thank you so much for this day and for the blessings you've given us and for the tremendous lessons that we heard to give us more confidence in your word and to help us see challenges that arise to your word and that they are not really difficult to face, that we can't answer them, we can have trust and reliance upon your word and confidence in it. We also pray that you be with the families that we have mentioned throughout the lectureship, be with the Harp family and Richard Harp especially as he recovers and pray that he'll be able to resume his normal activities. Pray that you be with Shirley Webb as she is uh, facing medical challenges and also be with the Wheeler family as Renee lost her uncle and pray that you would bless them and comfort them during this time. We pray that you also be with these, those traveling back and forth for the lectureship. We pray that you keep us safe from the virus and other things that are going on and help us, Father, to live your word out in our life. 
We love you and we thank you so much for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. And so we'll be back at 1050.
All right, we're about ready to begin our next session, so if you would uh, please find a seat <clears throat> and make your way to the auditorium. Uh, Brother Richard Meadows is going to lead us in a song, and he works with the North Lakeland Church of Christ. In that appropriate time, Brother John Farber, who is with us uh, this week with Latin American Missions, has a display set up in the hallway, and so if you haven't been by to see that, please do. And uh, Latin American Missions does a lot of wonderful works, and we've participated with their Yes To program for quite a bit, and actually some of us have participated in other campaigns, including my wife back in 2003, I think it was. And my wife had to hitch a ride with him across Costa Rica one time, I think it was, or Nicaragua, or somewhere like that, Nicaragua. And so he's a good brother in Christ. Thank you. And so we'll have Richard lead the song, and I'll let um, John know when the prayer will be, And but I'll... Song first, introduce lesson, prayer, and then Brother Hiram. Master, the tempest is raging, the billows are tossing high. The sky is o'ershadowed with blackness, no shelter or help is nigh. Carest thou not that we perish? How canst thou lie asleep? When small men so madly is threatening, a great in the angry deep. Master, the 
For the Hiram Camp is a 2016 graduate of the Florida School of Preaching, and he has a master's degree in Old Testament from Fried Hardeman University, and he is working on a PhD at the present time. And uh, he will be speaking on uh, sincerely disbelieving God's Word. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 1 Kings 13, uh, as you're going to see in a moment, 1 Kings 13. But before he speaks, Brother John Farber will lead us in prayer, and then Brother Hiram Kemp. Let's pray. Our loving God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful and thankful for the blessings that you shower in our lives. We know, dear God, that all wonderful gifts and the blessings that we receive come directly from you. We're grateful for the opportunity to use them in our lives, but we pray that you will help us to use them for your glory so that you will be elevated above all and that we will become less. We ask, dear God, that you will bless Hiram and his preparation. We're grateful for the diligence with which he prepares each of his lessons. We're grateful for uh, his time and study that he's put in, not just for this lesson, but over the years to prepare himself to be the man of God that he is. We pray to God that you will uh, bless the continuation of the, this lectureship. We're grateful for the Florida School of Preaching and the great work that they do to accomplish their mission of, of preparing men to share your word all over the world. We ask your God that you will help us as we strive to learn and to, to be the people that you would ask us to be. We pray all this through your son's blessed and holy name. Amen. And they did evil in the eyes of the Lord and followed in the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. That's really the concluding remark, or at least something similar to that, is said about each and every one of the kings in the northern kingdom. Every one of them, without exception, was wicked, and that is their demise. And it all started with a man named Jeroboam. This really goes back to 1 Kings 11. When Solomon married foreign wives and turned his heart away from God, God promised Solomon through prophets that he would eventually tear the kingdom away from Solomon and the kingdom would be divided. And that's exactly what happens. When you turn your Bible to 1 Kings chapter 12, what we see is that Solomon dies. He has a son named Rehoboam. Rehoboam will not listen to the counsel of the wise man. He listens to the younger man. And as a result, the nation of Israel is divided. Ten tribes go to the north, two tribes go down to the south. And when they do, God selects a man by the name of Jeroboam to be the king of the northern kingdom. Jeroboam starts out great. He starts out doing the right things until one day, 1 Kings 12, 28, he tells the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. And like Aaron before him, he builds two calves in Bethel, one in Dan, one in Bethel. These, O Israel, are the gods that delivered you and he goes further than that. In verse 31, he makes priests of what the Bible calls the lowest of the tribes, anyone he chooses. 1 Kings 12, 32, he changes the feast days. 1 Kings 12, 33, he begins to sacrifice on whichever days he sees fit. Israel's in trouble. People are doing all manner of evil and the idolatry that led to Solomon's rebellion and demise. Though Jeroboam moves north, the stench of that idolatry and wickedness follows him there to Samaria. And he continues to perpetuate that wickedness. And that brings us to 1 Kings chapter 13. What at first glance seems like an unusual chapter worthy of his own Q&A session because of the characters that are in it and the consequences that are theirs. Upon further inspection, we see this whole chapter is about the word of God. 
Ten times in this chapter you see that phrase, the word of God. It's in verse 1, it's in verse 2, it's in verse 5, verse 9. He mentions it in verse 17, 18, verse 20, twice in verse 26, and again in verse 32. The idea is this, the word of God and people's response to it in this chapter is supreme. But we need to proceed with caution. We might be tempted to view this chapter in isolation, but it needs to be viewed in the grand corpus of what we know as First and Second Kings. Because First and Second Kings is really the story about God's word delivered, God's word disbelieved, disobeyed, disregarded, and often leading to the deadly consequences of kings, prophets, and ultimately both nations. And so what we see in 1 Kings 13, though it seems to be unusual, is really in the long line of the pattern of these two books, And how it plays out. This phrase, by the word of the Lord, that specific phrase, appears seven times in 1 Kings 13 and only five other times in the rest of the Hebrew Bible. This chapter is about the word of God. And so in a lectureship on the God brief scriptures, it's only right that we look at 1 Kings 13 and what it has to say to us. What I want to do today is walk through 1 Kings 13. What does this chapter say? What happens in 1 Kings 13 with this idea of sincerely disbelieving? And then in the 10 minutes I'll have left when Brian gets up here, we'll do the six points that I have today. Let's begin. 1 Kings 13 and verse 1, there is a man of God, i.e. a prophet, that's sent to Jeroboam in Bethel. And he's sent there to cry against him because of the wickedness that he's practicing and the evil things that he's doing. And when he gets to Bethel, there is Jeroboam standing near the altar where he would offer these wicked sacrifices. And the prophet, the man of God, says to him, this very altar on which you sacrifice will one day be torn down by a man named Josiah. That's verses 2 down through verse 5, at which moment Jeroboam in his anger stretches out his hand and calls for the prophet to be apprehended. And in that moment when his hand shrivels up, he realizes that both God and his prophet mean business. And he cries out in verse 6 for God's prophet to spare him and to reach to plead to God on his behalf for his hand to be restored. And it is, verses 6 and verse 7. And he offers the prophet hospitality. He says, would you come back home with me? He was happy that the prophet had allowed his hand to be restored. And he sees in that moment that the prophet cannot do it. Verses 8 down through verse 10, the prophet tells him it wouldn't matter what he offered him. In the spirit of Balaam, you remember Numbers 22, 18, where he told Balak, though Balaam would give me, Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold. I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or to do more. The young prophet says, I can't do it. In fact, I can't eat or drink in this place. Verse 8 and verse 9, I have to go home another way. And he does. Look at verse 10. He's on his way home another way. He went. He rebuked Jeroboam. He did the mission. He's on his way home. But one thing happens that changes the trajectory of his life and the story. An older prophet in verse 11 hears about this young prophet through his sons, and he says, well, why don't you go get him and bring him home, and we can show him hospitality. We can show him how we do it in Bethel. Now, the jury's still out on whether or not this older prophet is a genuine prophet of God or a higher hand from Jeroboam, but it really doesn't matter. In verses 12 through verse 15, he tells the young prophet, come home with me. We would like to dine together. And The young prophet quotes verbatim what he quoted to Jeroboam only a few verses earlier, and he tells him, I can't eat in this place, drink water in this place. I've got to depart another way. Verse 18, I don't know if the older prophet desired his company or his demise or both, but verse 18 says, he told him, I too am a prophet, and an angel of the Lord has spoken to me, and he says, you're to eat and to drink. Come home with me. But the inspired penman says at the end of verse 18, But he lied to him. And in verse 19, he goes to his house, he eats and he drinks, and it's at that moment, verses 20 down through verse 24, that the word of the Lord actually comes to the older prophet. It comes to the older man, and he's told, tell the younger prophet, because he's eaten and because he drank with you, he won't make it home to be buried. He'll die in the open field. And he does. Verse 24, a lion slays him, a lion and a donkey stand side by side. The young prophet's body is there as a testimony to what happens to the disobedient. Word gets back to the older prophet, and as you might imagine, he is overwhelmed with sorrow. Verses 25 through verse 30, he tells his sons, go and get this person's body, go get the young man's body, and he buries it, crying out in verse 30, alas, my brother. And he tells his sons, when I die, you bury my bones next to the young prophet. The chapter ends by going back to Jeroboam's life. This is how it ends in verses 32 and 33. Goes back to Jeroboam with this summary idea. After all that's been done, Jeroboam persists. More than that, he goes further in his rebellion to continue to select priests from every tribe to serve, even appoints himself. 
And this is the exclamation mark on what began the chapter in his ultimate rebellion and God's righteous punishment of Jeroboam. What happens when people sincerely disbelieve the word of God? Six things from 1 Kings 13, and then the lesson will be yours, that we learn from this chapter that seems obscure and out of place, that we can apply to ourselves and to others. That will help us to be better Bible students and help our friends and neighbors. Number one, sincerity is not supreme. The older prophet comes to the younger prophet, and he tells him, I, too, am a prophet. The angel of the Lord has spoken by me. And then the text says, but he lied to him. Now, most people think this is all that it takes. If you really are sincere, if your heart is really open, if you really mean it, then it really doesn't matter in the end. In fact, people read the Gospels this way. People think that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus is often rebuking the Pharisees for their obsession with being right, but that's far from the situation. What Jesus is often doing is rebuking the Pharisees because they bind on men heavy burdens and pile their traditions on top of the Word of God, and they refuse to show compassion. But you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 15, 13 through 14, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up, and if the blind lead the blind, they both will fall into a ditch. It matters what we believe. And while sincerity is a virtue to be possessed by every child of God, it is not enough. In the shadow of the cross, Bruch preached on this on Monday night. But you remember in John 16, Jesus tells his disciples in verse 2, the hour is coming when individuals will persecute you and the people that kill you will think that they're doing God's service sincere but opposing the very mission of God. And so we need to proceed with caution when we talk to our friends and neighbors about the Bible. Sometimes we say all a person needs is an open heart to receive the word of God. They need more than that. The open heart without truth. If faith without works is dead, sincerity without truth is deadly. We have to be people that, yes, have open hearts, but not too open that anything is poured in. We need open hearts and coupled with that. It's what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 10, a love for the truth. Sincerity is important, but sincerity is not enough. Just because we really wish it were so, who could make the case against the young man in 1 Kings 13 that he wasn't sincere? And yet that didn't keep him from becoming Simba's lunch, did it? He was eaten. He was devoured. In his sincerity, he was destroyed. Jesus says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples Indeed, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free, John 8, 31 through 32. It matters what we believe. Our heart's disposition is important. Sincerity is a value to be cherished, but it's not the only virtue. We live in a society right now that says as long as you're sincere, as long as your heart's in it, as long as you mean well, it's great. But 1 Kings 13 is shouting out loud, just because you mean well doesn't mean it'll end well. You have to be purposeful. You have to plan and do what God says. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as God is righteous. 1 John 3 and verse 7. And this is by no means a license for God's people to say, hey, as long as we got the truth, doesn't matter our attitude or how we deliver it, doesn't matter how we carry ourselves. Attitude matters, but so does accuracy. And so we can be sincerely mistaken. Imagine you leave this lectureship this afternoon and you are on your way to the restaurant. You're driving 20 miles over the speed limit and you get pulled over and you say to the officer, well, it felt right. And I was just going with the flow of traffic. You ever tried that? And they flow you right to the, they flow you right to traffic court, right? That doesn't work. I was going with the flow of traffic. You move to a new neighborhood. You consistently, week after week, check the wrong mailbox, never seeing your light bill. What's going to happen in 30, 60 days? Wouldn't matter how sincere you were. I had a friend in high school one time, had a big afro, and he, one day, he went home to the shower, and his mom, unbeknownst to him, had switched the bottles, and what he thought was shampoo was actually Nair. He was sincere. He meant well, but his shaved head the next day at the bus stop was a testimony to the fact that sincerity is not all there is. Sincerity matters. It is not supreme. And so beware of thinking, just because my intentions are good, just because I don't mean to do anything evil, I don't mean to stand in opposition to the word of God, does not mean that it will not lead to our demise. Ask the young prophet. Number two, we should beware of settling for man's word over God's. The young prophet had just gone to Jeroboam, and he tells him verbatim in verses 8 through 10 of 1 Kings, you remember what he said? Jeroboam says, come back with me. You've healed my hand. Why don't you come back? We'll share a meal. He says, I can't eat bread or drink water in this place. God has told me. The word of the Lord's come to me. In fact, I can't return the same way that I came. Verse 10 has him going in the opposite direction. When approached by the older prophet initially in verses 16 and 17, he does the exact same thing, quotes it verbatim. This tells us you can quote the word of God word for word and not know the God of the word. 
You can quote it verbatim. He quotes the right passage, but he didn't know the truth. He didn't practice it at least. We need to be aware of settling for God's word over man. It's normally at this, junc this conjuncture in 1 Kings 13 that people have a sort of sympathy for the young prophet, but I don't believe the narrative is designed to produce such in us. We say, oh, what a pitiful man, but he really follows the pattern that you see throughout 1 Kings. What was Solomon's problem? His wives led him astray. And Ahab, Jezebel, 1 Kings 16 through chapter 21, led him astray. And Jeroboam, well, we'll just interview the young men and see what they have to say. Don't you see the pattern? Everybody in the book of 1 Kings does what everybody wants to do, never checking to see what would God have me to do. The young prophet should have said when he received this extra revelation or extra information in verse 18, you know what, that sounds strange. God didn't tell me. Hold on, I'll be back with you in a moment. He should have went and checked with the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 down through verse 22, we're told to prove or test all things, hold fast to that which is good, refrain from every appearance of evil. 1 John 4 and verse 1, John says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they be of God. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. He had a burden of responsibility upon him to search out and make sure that the things that he, were, he was being taught were actually true. But instead, he just settled. Instead, he just took somebody else's word for it. And because of that, he was led astray and he was deceived. And we need to guard against the same. Sometimes people think, well, God knows my heart. I know God wouldn't deceive me. I know this person. Too many people trust in their favorite commentators and pastors and preachers and priests, and they never find out for themselves whether or not this is actually true. No wonder Jesus was often saying to people, take heed what you hear, Matthew eleven fifteen. 15. Take heed how you hear, Mark 4, 24. Take heed with what ears you hear, Luke 8 and verse 18. Take heed what you hear, because it matters. This is why it's not enough to come into an auditorium like this one and be more impressed than we are engaged with the Word of God and making sure, check references, please. Ask questions, please. Underline and highlight. Check the cross references. Don't take anybody's word for it. The young prophet did. And just because this man said he was from God didn't mean that he was. I think it's interesting that every time somebody in the Bible, or at least most times, when somebody in the Bible wants to deceive somebody else, they call on a higher authority. He says, I'm a prophet of God, and an angel of the Lord told me. No wonder, Paul says in Galatians verse, verse 1, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or what does he say next? Or an angel from, Paul knew by inspiration, God anticipates error. And it's as if God knew that people in the centuries to come would try to buttress their false doctrine with, I received it from an angelic messenger. And Paul says, even if you were to receive it from one, it would still be false doctrine if it contradicts the truth. And so this young prophet, he shouldn't have settled for the words of men. So many people over and over again in their sincerity, they really don't mean any harm. They just think this person would never really do me any harm. Surely they wouldn't mislead me. Maybe you know what a Ponzi scheme is. A Ponzi scheme is really the idea of the earlier investors make money off of the later investors, which makes the enterprise seem legitimate. Charles Ponzi got rich off of this at least for a time. He promised his investors on one occasion they would receive 90% of, of profit in 45 days. And in 90 days, they would receive 100. One Federal Reserve statesman said concerning investments in Ponzi schemes, beware of over-exuberance in investing. Beware of irrational exuberance is what he called it. It's this idea that this person made a lot of profit. It doesn't really follow. The logic doesn't follow. There's no real paper trail, but it looks good to me most times. If it sounds too good to be true, it is. But people fall for it all the time. When Ponzi was arrested, he said the people were foolish. The numbers didn't add up. The math didn't make sense. Why on earth did they believe me? Because most people will believe anything if it sounds good enough. This prophet, he knew better. He had just preached to Jeroboam. He had just told Jeroboam, God means business. God means what he says. And yet he set up for the words of a man. And we need to guard against doing the same. We need to make sure. You know, when a man preaches the word of God or a woman in the proper setting is teaching from the word of God, and when they quote the word of God and expound it to us accurately, it's to be received as it is the word of God. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, Paul told the Thessalonians, we are glad that you received the word of God which you heard from us. It works effectually, and those of you that believe, it's not the word of man. It is, in truth, the word of God. But first, we've got to make sure that it is actually the word of God. We have to actually make sure what people are teaching us comes from God. 
And so you and I have to be our own priest. We've got to take our own spiritual growth and development into our own hands and make sure we're being taught right. So many people have sympathy for the young prophet, but they fail to see that he had a responsibility. He had a responsibility to do what was right and not take men's word over God. Number three, there are severe consequences that follow. When we don't do what God says, there will be severe consequences. The young prophet disobeys God, and then the older prophet actually receives revelation from God in verses 20 down through verse 24, and immediately he's told, you won't make it home. You won't receive a proper burial, which in Old Testament times was a great travesty. It's what's said about Jezebel. 2 Kings 9 and verse 10, she will be eaten by dogs and will not receive a proper burial. This was said about Jehoiakim in Jeremiah 36 that his body would be left out and exposed and he'd be eaten by the elements and destroyed by animals. When God says this about a person, this is the worst thing that could happen to somebody in Old Testament Israel. That is, you won't receive a proper burial by your loved ones. And those are the consequences for this young prophet. And it's the consequences for everyone who doesn't heed what God has to say. We've got to be careful. We've got to make sure that we align with the Word of God in such a way that this doesn't happen to us. The consequences of rebelling and disobeying God are severe. Ask Uzzah. Was Uzzah sincere? 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 6, the ark stumbled. All he did was touch it. But 2 Samuel 6 and verse 6 said they had his funeral immediately. He died automatically. The consequences were severe for disobedience, and they still are. God means what he says in his Word, and it doesn't mean that he's not gracious or compassionate. But when God warns us about something, and God means it. Sometimes people think all you have to do is be sincere, but there are consequences that follow. And if all we need to do is be sincere, then this Bible is far too long, isn't it? We should expect, if that were the case, to find four chapters in the Bible. In the beginning, creation. Detailed creation of man and woman in chapter 2. Chapter 3, the fall. Chapter 4, God simply saying to us, it's all good. Do your best. See you in the end. That's not what we find. Because God means business. Why all the laws? Why all the consequences? Why all of the statutes over and over again? Because to disobey God carries harsh consequences. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God, Hebrews 10, 31. And you and I have friends and neighbors, and sometimes brethren, that think, God's all right. He doesn't really mean what he says. And God's really not that angry, and God's not going to hurt anybody. It's like the days of Zephaniah, chapter 1 and verse 12. He won't do good. He won't do evil. It's all good. And there the carcass of the young prophet lay as a testimony to the fact that that's not true at all. Consequences are often deadly. Did you know in the United States, 12 million people every year are medically misdiagnosed? Of those 12 million, 40 to 80,000 of them suffer with things that ultimately later lead to their death. It's hard for me to believe. I know a few doctors, and it's hard for me to believe that anybody would maliciously do that, but that doesn't stop the funerals from happening. That doesn't stop people from hurting. That doesn't stop people from suffering because somebody messed up, somebody sincere, somebody that was doing the best that they could with the information that they had, and yet people still suffer. Jesus says in John 8 and verse 24, if you believe not that I am he, you will die in your sins. There are consequences to what we believe or what we fail to believe, and we're responsible for that. And so we must be aware. But here is number four. Some people should know better. Look at 1 Kings 13 and notice verse 1. Notice what this young prophet is called right at the outset. The Bible says, God sent a man of God from Bethel. Outside of the term prophet, man of God is his favorite designation for the prophets in the books of 1 and 2 Kings. He's a man of God. God's trying to grab our attention. Not only is he going to Jeroboam, but when he messes up later, he should know better. He's God's spokesman. He's God's prophet. And it's at this point that Christians should drink in 1 Kings 13 slowly and cautiously. The prophet should have known better. For all that we can say about him, he was deceived. And why did God allow this to happen? And how else was he supposed to know? Never let this escape our minds in 1 Kings 13. The prophet of God should have known better. No wonder 2 Peter 2 says, For those that have overcome the pollutions of this world and are again entangled therein, the latter end with them is worse than the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to depart from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it's happened to them according to the true proverb. The dog has returned to his vomit and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. 2 Peter 2, 20 to 22. Those that knew their master's will and didn't comply, they'll be beat with many stripes. To know better and not do it carries severe consequences. Sometimes we think, well, this person's sincerely disbelieving. But sometimes people know better, they just won't do better. 
I know God's no respecter of, of persons, but maybe this is really the philosophy or at least the thinking behind his harsh consequences. Think about it. Those that teach will be judged with a stricter judgment, James 3 and verse 1. And maybe this is a little bit of the philosophy behind why Nadab and Abihu suffer immediate death in Leviticus 10, 1 and 2. They're the first priests, the sons of the high priest Aaron, and they should have known better. And yes, what they offered was unauthorized, and I'm not saying that God makes exceptions. What I'm saying is this throughout Scripture. God holds people to a higher account who should know better. And this prophet is consumed and destroyed immediately to say to Jeroboam, as he would later know of this individual's body and follow in the same, same regard, that God means business. And sometimes when people should know better and they don't, God has to do shocking things to get their attention. Think about Ananias and Sapphira. As the church begins, Acts chapter 2, there's benevolent giving. Acts chapter 5, they lie about their gift. And what happens to them? Immediately, they're destroyed because God means business. And sometimes the people that know better, they don't do better. In 2017, nine Lakeland police officers were suspended. They were coming back from a K-9 uh, competition. They were all clocked at going 101 miles per hour. Why were they suspended? They knew better. They just did what they thought was best at the time. And sometimes when people know better and they disobey, God brings down the heavy consequences. This prophet knew better. Now, what about us? How many times do we say, well, I was just doing the best that I could, and we end our prayers with God, forgive me, but we are willfully just charging into unrighteousness. We are willfully doing whatever we should. This young prophet is just like Jeroboam. They both started out right. They started out doing the right thing, and eventually they go their own way. And he should have done the right thing. He should have known not to disobey God. Number next, sincere disbelief is still disbelief. In the end, it really doesn't matter. With Jeroboam, it's pride. With this young prophet, it's gullibility. But in the end, sincere disbelief is still disbelief. People that say, well, I thought I was doing the right thing, and I thought the sinner's prayer would save me, it's still disbelief. If true biblical belief leads to obedience, the greatest problem with disbelief or unbelief is that it's ultimately disobedience. I can think of no greater example on this point than Saul of Tarsus. You remember what he said before the high priest in Acts 23 and verse 1? I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day, and he was charged, and he was zealous, and he was wrong and mistaken. Later on in 1 Timothy 1, Paul says, Before I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy. I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. He was mistaken. No wonder his heart goes out to Jewish people in Romans 9 and in Romans 10 because he's been where they are. He knows what it's like to be passionate, to be zealous, to be sincere, and be wrong. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. But though sincere, and though they have Abraham's fleshly blood flowing through their veins, sincere disbelief is still disbelief. Satan doesn't really care in the end. If he gets us with pride, he'll take that. If he gets us through gullibility and through our ignorance, he'll take that too. He doesn't really care. He'll try all of the baits. You know why? It's because he knows that in the end, the conclusion for both parties is the same. It's ruin. The Hebrew writer says over and over again, Israel could not enter in into Canaan because of their unbelief. Some of them might have been sincere in the wilderness. I don't see how God's going to get us there on these small provisions that we have. It was still unbelief. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God, Hebrews 3 and verse 12. Unbelief is unbelief. Whether we're sincere or not, we need to check our hearts and be sure that we're not led astray, that we don't get taken off the path, because the devil doesn't care which bait he has to use to trip us up. He just simply wants to do it. Any wonder, then, that Ananias, or excuse me, Priscilla and Aquila, they come alongside Apollos. He was eloquent. He was mighty in the scriptures. And he was wrong, wasn't he? And what did that couple do? They didn't say, well, close enough. At least he knows about baptism. He knows John the Baptist. He's close enough. The Bible says they taught him the word of God more perfectly or accurately. And do you know why they did that? Because though he was sincere and though he was mighty, it didn't matter. He was wrong. And in Acts 19, the first six verses, Paul takes those 12 men from Ephesus, and they have been immersed. But for the wrong reason, with the wrong baptism, he's got to teach them the right way. Because sincere disbelief, still disbelief. I've got family members and loved ones who sincere as they could be. 
pious as they could be, as benevolent and kind, and you try to show them in the Bible what the New Testament says, and they say, I know I'm in the right relationship, Hiram, because I am doing the very best that I can. I don't really need 100 verses to convince me. I think I'm doing pretty good. I think I'm doing the right thing, and they're sincere, and they're passionate. They're not necessarily, in their minds, enemies of unrighteousness. They're not charlatans trying to convince people to go against God. They're still mistaken. 1 Kings 13 says to us, we really need to be checking behind ourselves and others and making sure that we are following along the right lines because God wants us to be obedient. Here's the last one. What's the servant's response to people that are in sincere unbelief? Give the older prophet credit for his compassion. When he heard about the young prophet, you know what he did in verse 30? He went down with his sons and he said, alas, my brother, he was sorry for the young man's demise instigated by his deception. And he told his sons, when I die, you bury me side by side with him. Give him credit. At least he was compassionate. We might know the truth. doesn't make us better than anybody. We see people falling headlong into false doctrine and error. There's really nothing funny about it. They won't be devoured by lions. The Bible says there's something more severe awaiting them. 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8. Nothing funny about it. We need the heart of compassion for people. Thank God you were born in a family where you were taught the truth. Thank God for his providence that allowed us to collide with the truth as our hearts were open and we were truth seekers and we've obeyed, but we're not better than anybody because of that. Our response should be that of the older prophet when we see people going headlong away from God in apostasy or in ignorance. Alas, my brother or my sister, I want to come alongside him and help him. Turn your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2, and notice what Paul says in verses 24 down through verse 26. And he's talking to a preacher, but this is true about anybody. It's true about any Christian that would be actively engaged in teaching others. He says, but the servant of the Lord must not strive or quarrel, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves, that perhaps God would grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and they might recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Is that your heart and mind in evangelism? Are we just shooting out verses trying to make people look bad? Is this Bible jeopardy where we see who knows most and who can score the most points? When we see people in sincere disbelief, this has to be our heart. Paul met sincere disbelief all the time on his missionary tours. He never let it discourage him. He wanted to pray for more boldness and open doors, Ephesians 6 and verse 19. That has to be you. That has to be me. When we see people that are mistaken, when we see people that are taken off into error because they sincerely disbelieved it, we've got to be 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 26 type people. We've got to say to people, hey, I want to help you. I want to help you to learn the truth. I don't want this to be your end. Come alongside me and let me help you to see just like Philip did with the Ethiopian eunuch. What we can't miss in 1 Kings 13, we might get the idea that, you know what, God was pretty harsh in the Old Testament. He attended a grace seminar during the intertestamental period, and boom, in the New Testament, here's Jesus, grace and mercy. He's been gracious all the time. 1 Kings 13 is dripping with grace from verse 1 all the way down through the end of the chapter. He first sent a prophet to Jeroboam, and he didn't have to do that to warn him about his impending doom. Afterwards, he later gives the prophet an opportunity. The prophet disobeys, goes his own way, and when he's destroyed, Jeroboam sees this. It's an opportunity for him to change. Verse 32 and verse 33 show us his heart that is just set on living in rebellion against God, and it's because of that that he ultimately is destroyed. And then it's preserved for us so we can go back and read it. Appreciate the context of 1 Kings. This was written to people who were in Babylonian captivity. It's to say to them, look at your history. Look at what happened. Don't let it happen again. You know better now. Don't be like this. When you come home, be better. Forsake the foolish way and live. Proverbs 9 and verse 6. 1 Kings 13 is the story of 1 and 2 Kings throughout the Bible. It's delayed retribution by deity on disobedient humanity who deserves to have their lives snuffed out because we've spit in the face of our God and we've chosen to go in another way. And God says, I'm giving you chances. Sincerely believe me. Whether you've studied 1 Kings before or not, you know this story. It's the story of the whole Bible, isn't it? It's Eve in Genesis chapter 3. She let the volume of Satan who tried to play like God's editor change her mind about what she already knew to be true she believed the lie, gave to her husband, and he did eat. And unlike the Calvinists, we know that we're not infected with their sin, but we really know better. We've had their example in Calvinists.
us others. And yet we, like the young prophet, have, have allowed the devil and his henchmen to deceive us, and we've all gone astray. 1 Kings 13 is the drama of the Old Testament played out from Genesis through Malachi, where God speaks to his people in love and in grace, and we decide we know better, we want something better. God doesn't mean what he says, but God had a plan. One day, he would just do it himself. He would take on sinful flesh and live the life we could never live and die the death that we deserve to die. He would be tempted. And he would quote scripture in Matthew 4, but not only would he quote the right passage, he would continue to walk in the right path. He couldn't be swayed any other way. He lived the right way. He lived perfect. He never committed a transgression. And just when we think we know how the story ends, you know how it ends. The disobedient are punished. The righteous are saved. The only sinless man who ever lived died when he was perfectly obedient. Peter says in the second gospel sermon, Acts 3, 14 and 15, the prince of life died. Did you get it? Life died so that dead people could live. Jesus did it for us. And then he says, now you really have to believe. If you don't believe, you'll die in your sins, John 8, 24. If you believe, you'll enjoy everlasting life, John 3, 16. You didn't see it, but it was written down so that everybody who believes will have eternal life. John 20, 30 through 31, believe and be saved. Avoid the error of the young prophet who sincerely disbelieved. Truly believe and know eternal life. Truly believe and be rescued from yourself. God wants to do it, and God wants to do it for us. The young prophet is an example of what happens when we allow the devil and his word to get into our hearts more than that of God. And God says, I want to rescue you. And he came across the clouds to do it. And now our message to everyone else in the world needs to be, believe on Jesus and be saved. Thank you. We're going to have the lecture ship. Gonna, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, we're going to have the lecture ship, you know. And then someone say, well, we're not going to come. Uh, we're kind of afraid or whatever. So we had about 10 lessons, possibly. Well, we had eight for sure, possibly 11 at the time. <clears throat> and so we thought, well, you know, we'll have these guys come in live when it's their slot. I, thought, nah, I don't know, Murphy's Law, you know, I mean, that thing can, can, can be a mess. You can get a snowstorm, wipe out the Internet up north or whatever, who knows. And then we thought, well, you know, maybe we'll have them record it, and then we'll just play it, you know, when it's their slot. And then we thought, well, I don't know. Because there's other people have been asking if we're going to have the lectureship that are not speakers. And so we're thinking, well, you know, if somebody takes the trouble to come here, I don't think they're going to want to watch something on the screen. They can stay at home for that, you know. So we thought, well, you know what? We have plenty of people that can stand in the gap and uh, just get that spot if something should happen. And, uh, and as I've always said, <clears throat> and not just this lectureship, but previous lectureships, when <clears throat> somebody can't show up, I mean, that's, that's double good stuff. And so we have the manuscripts of those, uh, if you've seen the color poster with the color pictures around it, that's who was, that's, that was the lectureship. And all those people have manuscripts in the book and everything. And so, well, of course, some of them have the, the lost chapters, but you know. <clears throat> but they all wrote a lesson in that, and so, but if they didn't come, then someone else preaches, and so we have twice the lesson. And, uh, and I think that's great. And so I have, this lectureship has more double lessons in it than any other book, but that's all right. And so it ended up, if everybody shows up the rest of the day, then we will have had 10, uh, cha uh, 10 lessons we had to have people fill in for. <clears throat> that's almost a third of the lectureship. 32 slots is what we have, eight per day times four not counting the question and answers. And actually we have 
35 counting the ladies' classes. And so that's all there. And so we're all good with that. But anyway, I say all that to say that we have men like Hiram, Bruce, uh, Joshua, <clears throat> um, others whose names escape me now. Forrest was on standby. His was the 11th one, but the guy showed up, so he's, he's free. But he was on standby. And so we, we had se several guys can stand in the gap. And uh, Terrence over there is one of them. And so uh, we got this covered by the grace of God. And so, uh, but we uh, say all that to just appreciate uh, y'all coming, appreciate the speakers who are filling in, and there'll be others coming as well. And, um, you know, then of course you have the crowd, well, you shouldn't have it and all that stuff, you know. And I'm like, well, we got this now. Uh, back, back in the women's liberation movement, you know, you had the Statue of Liberty doing this with another piece of garment, but I can't wait till we're doing this with this thing. But anyway, um, appreciate y'all's patience and your cooperation. <clears throat> and it's, it's turned out a great lectureship, and along that line, great news, had some awesome Christians sacrificing lots of money. Uh, we're still about, I think, about 300, 400 maybe short, uh, but man, that is awesome. Uh, and so I have full confidence, now don't, 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 you know, lock down your wallet or anything, but I have full confidence that they'll come in, <clears throat> either in person or online, and so uh, please help us if you can. Um, but man, it's just, God is just so awesome, I'm telling you, and uh, we appreciate that. <clears throat> and that reminds me of the um, prayer list. Uh, actually, is C.J. Grimes okay? We have C.J. Grimes is going to lead us in a prayer in just a moment, and he is the um, associate minister of youth and family, I think it's called, the title there. And he's a, uh, boy, man, is it 2019? graduate or 18 18 2018 graduate of the four school of preaching and uh sebring congregation is where he is located and they're the ones that are mainly in charge although it's still a joint effort cooperation but they're going to be the ones it was their idea and they backed it up with the supplies and the labor uh to to have the, the hot meal today chili and so uh, he's going to lead us in a prayer in just a moment and uh, thanks for the food as well will be included in that uh, but we do want to remember <clears throat> those that we've been mentioning. Renee Wheeler lost her uncle, so the Wheeler family, the Harp family, and then Shirley Webb, who's the grandmother, who is really like a mother of one of our students, uh, who is there in Port Charlotte. And then Dennis uh, let me know today that Siomara Brazil uh, passed away. She leaves behind a, she's a single mom. She just passed away from cancer, and she leaves behind a 16-year-old son. So we'll add that family to our prayers. And uh, I'll leave this little note up here, but um, we do have lunch, and after lunch, we have a great program lined up for the afternoon, uh, and Thursday, uh, word problems. You know, we're talking about god scripture, the word of God, and so word problems, um, and all these are statements taken uh, from the Bible. <clears throat> Kevin Patterson, who is the pulpit minister at the Sebring Parkway Church of Christ, at 1.30, he will speak on, I will send a famine in the lamb, land, quote unquote, Bruce Doherty, who's filling in for Guyton Montgomery, destroyed for a lack of knowledge, and then Rico Brown, uh, mistaken, not knowing the scriptures. And so all these are challenges and results of not wanting the word of God, and so they will bring us lessons on that. Also at 3.30, uh, Kathy Pollard, I may have said Katie last night, but I thought about Catherine or Kathleen, but it's Kathy, actually, Kathy. Anyway, we'll go with Kathy. But anyway, appreciate her. Uh, Brittany had Monday. Tuesday, we didn't plan one because of usually have appreciation banquet, uh, but <clears throat> we didn't have that this year. And so uh, Brittany Kemp had Monday, and I believe we didn't live Facebook live that one, just technical difficulties first day. Uh, but uh, it is available on a link on YouTube. We will. Yesterday, we had Facebook live and a link for Kathy's, and then today we'll also. And her lesson is, if you're a lady, uh, as it is in truth, the Word of God, all right? But anyway, so she'll have that at 3.30, and we'll have question and answers. Now, <clears throat> um, any, any of the topics today are subject to any questions that you might have on that, and the afternoon speakers will kind of form a panel, panel on that, and we'll answer those questions at that time. But a great lineup for this afternoon. Appreciate your being here. Look forward to a nice, nice meal at lunchtime, uh, provided by God through the Sebring Parkway Church of Christ and others. 
And so at this time, we'll ask Brother C.J. Grimes to come and lead us in a prayer, and then we will be dismissed. Let's pray. Almighty Heavenly Father, it is good for us to be here. Father, we're grateful for this opportunity we have to come together to hear your word boldly proclaimed. And Father, we're grateful for the Florida School of Preaching and all that it does, the preparation that it does for this lectureship and to prepare those to go out and labor in your vineyard. And Father, please be with those that were mentioned before. We're been mindful of the Wheeler family and the Webb family and the Hart family and all the, the struggles and difficulties that they are going through. And Father, please help them to lean on you for strength and guidance in all things and for comfort. And Father, we're also uh, ask that you be with the Brazil family and uh, passing away of the, the young lady with the son. Father, please be with him and help your church to reach out to him and tend to him and care for him and for him to lean on you also. And Father, we're grateful for uh, every blessing of life that you, you give us, especially the blessing of your son who died on the cross for our sins. And Father, uh, we pray that we do all things in, in a way that pleases you. And Father, please bless the food that we are about to partake of. Please bless it to nourishment of our bodies and help us to take that nourishment out and do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Time, but anyway, yes, sir. Now, oh, I was gonna say you can enjoy it now, but no, you one more, more, man. One more. That's all right. You enjoy it, Joshua. That's, that's right. right. That's right. I know it sounds crazy, but you're still my baby. You always be my baby.